Yes, a new creation, a new creation of it. And, uh, you know, talk about being changed. And one of the ways that can help you in this journey is at our Step Up Conference. I just want to push that because you go to register. Even like I said, if you're coming on Sunday night and you will be eating a meal with us and question and answer time with Bob Russell. And some of y'all might say, well, who's Bob Russell? And Bob Russell is from Louisville, Kentucky, and went to minister there uh, back in the 60s. And church was around 200 and grew to be over 200, I mean 20,000. 20, and so uh, just an amazing fella. Humble servant of God. I'm going to tell you, humble servant of God. Brett Andrews from Chantilly will be speaking with us. And Tim Cole, our friend from Waypoint, which is one of the ministries we support, helping plant churches. And, and so, you know, we are looking forward to this. And then the breakout groups. I, I always say there's different breakouts for you. Check it out to help you grow in Christ. And one of my hear people say, I don't know what my spiritual gift is. Well, there's actually one for that. Uh, also, different things for your spiritual growth are there. And if you're retired, you're like, well, what do I do? Well, Larry Beach uh, is going to be coming up, and he's going to be actually leading one of the sessions on uh, serving in retirement. Uh, so that, that's the, he's a retired minister, but he's not retired, if you know what I mean. He's still busy about the work of the Lord. So keep those things in mind. But you know, people have to talk about change. As a matter of fact, do you know what we're supposed to be celebrating tomorrow? The spring. First day of spring. I would have thought that y'all would have just like jumped, like play bit. I thought it would have been like dancing, you know. Yes, it's how. And, and spring is about change, things changing. And, and so, you know, we celebrate change. And we think about change in, in our lives. And people want to change things about their lives. Now, my friend Scott Gold here, uh, he, he got married a while, a long while back. And, and, and so everything was great, you know, everything was wonderful. But then he starts having some problems in his relationship. And, and Scott's thinking, you know, I, I've heard that Paul Crawford is the great expert in marriage because he told us that marriage is hard. It's hard. And so he calls up Paul and says, Paul, I need some advice from you. He said, you are an expert in marriage. And Paul says, well, I'll tell you what, let's go fishing tomorrow out of the lake. And we're out there fishing. You know, we can relax, enjoy God's, you know, beauty and, and, and pray and think about this. So they're out there fishing. Finally, um, Paul says, because Scott, what's, what's going on? Paul, Scott's like, oh, I met this woman. I thought she was a perfect woman. But then things started going bad there for a little bit. And I, I'm thinking about maybe I just need to change and, and, and leave her or something. And, and uh, he's like, why? He said, well, she had not talked to me in two weeks. And Paul sat there for me. He said, you're, you're the marriage expert. You know, tell me what to do. And Paul looked there and, he, and Paul says, you're thinking about leaving her. And she hadn't talked to you in two weeks. You better reconsider. A woman like that is hard to find. <laughs> so... Please forgive me, ladies, okay? Men, you can laugh. It's all right. She'll beat you up when you get home. That's okay. <laughs> that was from Paul. He just got a big head on that one. But people like to change things. They're like, they look at their life. They want to change some things. Tell me some things that people would like to change about their lives. Their weight. Change by renewed spirit. Change by renewed spirit, yes. Financial situation. Grow more hair. <laughs> hair. Anything else? Become more disciplined. Become more disciplined. What was the other one? Being left-handed. Being left-handed. You want to be right-handed? Yeah, I want to be right-handed. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> hey, people want to change their hair color, their skin color. I mean, you got white people got in tan. Like, I want to get darker. And sometimes darker people are like, I would like to be lighter. You know, so we're always, like, wanting to change in our lives. And some of them are changes, but... This morning we're talking about something that probably all of us would like to change some, and that's changed emotions. Changed emotions. And, and, and so we're going to be reading from the book of Ephesians again, chapter 4, and uh, we're going to kind of bounce around through a couple of verses there as we look at this letter. And there are some things in life that uh, sometimes seem to get out of order in our lives, to get out of order. And, and uh, so there may be struggles and some things that are out of control in your life. And so maybe this morning you're like, okay, I want to see what God's word has to say, to say to me. Because trust me, you're not alone. You're not alone in this. And maybe even today when stressful things happen, and we've seen what's happened for the last few years, um, some of this stuff really rare, you know, rears its ugly head in our lives. And so we want to see what God's word says to help us. And then also so that we can be a better witness. We want to be a new person, a changed person. So people look at us and go like, I'd like to have what you've got. What do you have? Jesus. That's what it is. So let's pray before we look into Scripture. 
Father, you are an awesome God. You're God who made us, who created us. You know what's best for us. And yet, I confess that many times I don't pay enough attention to what you have to say to me. And so I ask that you would help us as we look into your word today, that you would speak today and not me. And I thank you for letting me be part of your family, letting me do these things, yet I know it is you. I'm unworthy. And so I ask for your spirit to speak to our hearts today, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we look at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22, verse 22, and we've used this scripture a couple times in this series. It says, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off the old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires. Now, I've used this next quote here a couple times in this sermon series because it is so true. But not as, not as it just true, but when we become followers of Christ, we desire to do this. And we really need to do this. And so, here we go. Here's the quote. Your new life will cost you your old one. Remember that. Your new life in Christ will cost you your old life. It's sort of like trading in an old vehicle, if you would, which has all kinds of problems, all kinds of issues, and you're going to trade it in for a new vehicle. Or for those of you who work on vehicles, you can compare it to that old part, that old starter or whatever, and you exchange it as a core in for a new part. Your old part, your old starter was bad. It wasn't working anymore, and you wanted to buy a new one, and that company wants that old one, so it can renew that old part, and so you turn it in. The new one is so much better than the old one, and that is the way it is when we become followers of Jesus. If we truly strive to follow Jesus, our old lives are not good, you see. So our old lives, before we met Jesus, are being corrupted. Corrupted. So you say corrupted. Corrupted. All right. Corrupted. To change from good to bad. To degrade with unsound principles or moral values. Now, I like this definition. To alter from the original or correct form or version. Wow. We hear that term a lot, and it might be a smart act, but a lot of times you'll see people maybe in politics, and they have all the good intentions, and then they drink the water, you know, especially when you're talking, you know, politics on a federal level, and, and they have all the good intentions, but then they get corrupted. Something happens. You know, they see the system and how the system can benefit them. And so they begin to make decisions based upon how it can benefit them and how they can stay in power, how they can make more money on the side or whatever it might be. It's also happened with ministers who started out with good intentions and then popularity came in. And the next thing you know, they're doing things to become more popular and to gain financial uh, wealth. And, and so there's ways you can be corrupted. And we are corrupted. You see, I, like I said, I like that last definition, to alter from the original or correct form or version. We have been changed from our innocence as a child because sin has corrupted us. It has corrupted us. And when we come to Christ, the Holy Spirit now lives within us. And when we allow him to work within us, he changes us. He changes us. We trade the old core, the old part, for the new part, the new part. But what are some of the things which deal with our emotions that, that God's Spirit wants to help us change? We're going to look at this. Let's see what Paul writes, Ephesians 4, 26. In your anger, do not sin, and do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. And I'll read another verse, Ephesians 4, 31. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. Now, Paul writes the here, and when you look at those words, you, you know, he, he's trying to see that we need some help here in certain areas. His Holy Spirit helps us with uncontrolled emotions. Uncontrolled emotions. What was that? Uncontrolled emotions. All right. One of the things we see that Paul addresses here is anger. Anger. Now, he doesn't say anger in itself is a sin. I mean, Jesus himself got angry. Matter of fact, in Mark chapter 3, it's recorded that Jesus goes into the synagogue, and in there he meets a man with a shriveled hand. And so as he is in there with that man with a shriveled hand, he, he wants to heal him. But there were some in there who were watching. What's he going to do? Is he going to heal on the Sabbath or not? 
Watch him because we want to get him in trouble. Watch him. See if he's going to do something on the Sabbath. He's going to heal. And, and so Jesus looked at them because he knew their thoughts. He knew what they were thinking. He said, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or evil, to save life or to kill it? But they remained silent. It says, he looked around at them in anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts and said uh, to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched out his hand, and his hand was completely restored. So Jesus himself got angry at things. Uh, you might call it a righteous anger. So Paul says, in your anger, do not sin. It is when your anger becomes uncontrolled. When you lose control, when you're angry about something, and how often you get angry, if you are easily angered. Anger can cause us to do things we normally would not do. We normally would say things we wouldn't say. I mean, look back here. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, slander, along with every form of malice. Now, when we read this in verse 31, we think that Paul is using a lot of synonyms. And Tim Hawkins, who's a Christian comedian, and sometimes if you need to sort of lighten up your day, you can listen to Christian comedians like Tim Hawkins. But he said, have you ever noticed people that say these long prayers, sound in the sound, real religious? He said, they get up there, Lord, guide us, lead us, show us, tell us. He's like, what are you, a walking th the source or something? I mean, walking around telling God all these things. It seems like Paul is using a lot of synonyms here, but not really. I mean, when you're looking at them, uh, you look at these, and they're not really truly syn synonyms uh, because it looks like what can happen in, in the progress of our anger, things get kind of worse when you're reading these words. It can lead to bitterness. Bitterness. Our anger can lead to bitterness. It's not taken care of. It can lead to slander about people. It can lead to slander. It can lead to brawling, you know, fighting out there. It can lead to rage, and it can lead to malice. Malice is the, un, is the intentional uh, or desire to do evil. The intentional desire to do evil. It is a desire to inflict injury or harm or suffering on someone else. And so we need to realize that these uncontrolled emotions need to change because the Holy Spirit does not want us to live that way. God doesn't want us to live that way. We weren't designed to live that way. We have been corrupted. We've been corrupted by sin. So Paul also writes in Ephesians 4, 27, and do not give the devil a foothold. When we give the devil a foothold, it causes personal harm. Personal harm. What can it cause? Personal harm. Yes. And so have you ever seen someone that, that was, had uncontrolled emotions? Have you ever seen it? Yeah, yeah. And you know what? A lot of times anger makes people look ugly. <laughs> you know, I mean, their anger comes out, you're like, oh, man, they're, they're ugly looking right there. You know, they ain't pretty looking. So, so here, but here's this personal harm that can happen. Uh, someone then becomes bitter. You ever seen a bitter person? Yeah. yeah. That's a person who can't say anything good about anybody. They, they, you know, they're, they're, everything is wrong. Everybody's wrong. Everything's wrong. Their whole life is terrible. Where'd they come from? Some of them could have come from an anger issue from way back and, and so now or something deep inside that we'll talk about here in just a moment that has never been taken care of and so now they've become this bitter bitter person and they seek revenge they're always wanting revenge and, and, and you know you know you've been hurt you've been hurt and, and, and so when you have those hurt feelings whether you get angry or not but when you have hurt feelings it is easy sometimes to think they're going to get it someday they're going to get That's when you need to pray, God, God said, I'll take care of it. You let me handle it. You just turn it over to me because when you seek revenge, when you have resentments, terrible things happen to you. Someone once said, uh, holding a grudge or resentment is like drinking poison and hoping it will kill your enemy. <laughs> and that's true because you're killing yourself. You're drinking this poison and you're becoming this bitter, bitter person. And that person did. I've been hurt. So you're not even angry, even that emotion of being hurt. You know, I've been hurt. And, and, and so that hurt just keeps driving at you and driving. That's where you need God's spirit uh, to move in you. So and we need to be very careful that, that we let things go, that we work on things and pray to them when we've been wrong. And so, you know, so we're not purposefully ruining someone else's life while in turn we're, we're ruining ours. You know, we can hold grudges and that gets us into trouble. So one day, Paul Crawford, Paul's like, man, Dave, not again. Paul Crawford and Tony, they're on vacation. And they're walking around this nice place. And Tony says, oh, look, there's a wishing well. 
And so she said, let's try and see, see just, just for fun. So she gets a penny out, and she drops it down that well, and along with hits the thing, and she stands back and smiles. Then Paul walks up and gets a penny, and he falls into the well. Tony looks up and says, wow, it does work, doesn't it? <laughs> so, I know, but your daughters love that. She did love it, I can't tell you. So, but I'm going to have to repent for them after today. But, but, you know, holding any kind of grudge is not good for us. You know, um, so what are the effects of holding a grudge? You know, if you struggle uh, with finding forgiveness, uh, you might become more angry and bitter, and, and uh, it'll ruin, you know, experiences and things. Matter of fact, I, I found this article. It's kind of neat. I found this article on Mayo Clinic a website. The Mayo Clinic is a nonprofit American academic medical center. So it's not like, you know, it's this religious thing looking to the Bible. And it says, what are the effects of holding a grudge? Um, if you struggle with, you know, finding forgiveness, uh, you might become, you might bring anger and bitterness into new relationships. It'll carry over. It'll carry over into new relationships and experience terrible things. Um, you become so wrapped up in the wrong that you can't enjoy the present because your mind is always going to how you were wronged and, and what was wrong and you got angry. Depression can set in because of these things because, you know what, you're not getting the payback you thought you might get because this person did that to you. You become irritable. You become anxious. You know, you feel at odds with your God. Uh, your, your, you know, this says spiritual beliefs. Uh, you, you lose valuable and enriching connections with others because of what's happened. And so we've got to be very careful, whether it's anger or whether it's hurt that has come into our lives, these emotions, that we don't let them control us. Marlena Dietrich, who was an actress of years back, said this, Once a woman has forgiven her man, she must not reheat her sins for breakfast. So... And that goes both ways. Then you're like, like, dude, you just like slapping us women around today. You know, no, it, that goes both ways. In other words, forgive and move on. So what do we do? I mean, you're like, you know, I deal with these things. I struggle with these things. But the answer is found here in Paul's letter. If we go back a, a verse or so when, before we started reading, there's a couple words to kind of introduce this next scripture. Uh, and that is, he says, you were taught. So then we'll read this scripture, Ephesians 4, 23 and 24. You were taught to be made new in your attitudes and in your minds. And to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. So when I read this, I see that Paul is telling us, allow the new life to grow. Allow the new life to grow. Say that in a big voice. Allow the new life to grow. Let's say it one more time so we get in our heads. Allow the new life to grow. Yes, we need to allow this to go because let me tell you, we can quench the Holy Spirit. We, you know, it isn't like, oh, the Holy Spirit got a hold on me and I can't control it. You don't see that in the Word of God. You are an open vessel to allow God to work through you and to minister to you. And it's amazing how the Holy Spirit works sometimes. It, it just blows my mind because, like yesterday, I was doing a memorial service, and um, when well, I was in there, and I, I didn't have it down in my notes. I didn't know the lady, but I was doing this memorial service. But I mentioned something during the service. And this one lady comes up after me, and she said, you don't know how you just released something in me. What she said. And I said, well, what was that? And she said, you said that it's okay when things happen to be angry with God at first. It's okay to let God know you're not happy with what's happened. Because God knows you. He created you. He knows your emotions. Just don't stay angry with God. And she said, 17 years ago, I lost a son. And she said, I got angry with God for a while. I questioned God. And people told me, don't do that. You can't do that. God will never. And she said, it was like a burden lifted for me. And I'm sitting there going, I said, well, it wasn't in my notes. And it wasn't me. And sometimes God places people in certain places and other people. And the Holy Spirit ministers in that way. And I'm amazed how the Holy Spirit works and how he ministers. And God can work even in our weakness. And Monday, I had a memorial, a funeral service, and a friend of mine, his dad passed away from Paul Paul from years back. And so anyway, I go in Sunday night and, and uh, meet the family, talk, meet more of the family talking. And, and, and so Monday morning, I'm here in the office, and I go change my clothes. I'm getting ready. I got everything ready. So I thought, well, I'm going to stop up the bank before I go in there, and I'm going to stop at the store. And I get ready to pull out. I get a text from his son. It says, Hey, are you close? And I'm thinking, why is he asking me that? He's got something he wants to share. Then I looked at the time on my cell phone. The clock in my office had not been changed. 
oh, I confess I was driving very fast on the road to Pope. Okay, I'm like, I am on my way. Please forgive me. And, and so, yes, I get in there, and it's about a half hour later. And you know it's like when people are all sitting in there, and you're the one they're waiting on. You know, how embarrassing, how terrible. I'm like, I, so I walked up to his son. I said, do you have what you were going to write down? He's like, yeah, but take a breath. You're all right. So the funeral director, he says, hey, Dave, I'll say something for you to get up here. So he gets up and said, our service is about to begin. He said, usually when I see the minister the night before, or I see Dave and he's doing the ministry, I'll say, we'll see you tomorrow, and we won't start without you. Yep, that's what happened. But God still works to, and I'm thankful to the family for being very, uh, you know, very gracious at that time, because I felt like dirt, you know, at first there, not realizing, but I'm sorry, so I'm telling the government, quit, leave our clocks alone, please, just leave our clocks alone. So, by the way, if you want to, I don't know if it's stuck in the Senate or the Congress, just for a little bit, you can like, contact them and say, please push that bill through, tell them not to change these clocks. But anyway, how we get on that, let's get back. God can use us as the Holy Spirit, no matter how our shortcomings happen. Okay? And even in our lives, uh, he, he can begin to work to help us. And, and so, you know, once you decide to follow Jesus, you have to allow him to, the Holy Spirit, to make a difference in your life, to bring change into your life. You need to recognize the sins that are in your life. One of the good things is to have an accountability partner, someone you're close to that you can trust. And when Sally said this, when someone puts their trust in you, do not break it. Do not gossip. Do not start talking about what they've told you. Zip the lip and, and pray unless their life is in danger. You know, they're saying, I'm thinking about killing myself tonight. You know, then, yes. But other than that, you be the Christian you're supposed to be, realizing that there's things in your life that you want to tell somebody, but you don't want everybody knowing that you're seeking for help. So if somebody trusts in you, be trustworthy. So here it goes. Paul says this, uh, Ephesians 4.32. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. And believe it or not, there's a translation out there called the Easy English Bible. And it says, instead, help one another and be kind to each other. Forgive one another. Remember that God has forgiven you because of what Christ has done. Forgiveness is not a sign of weakness. It is not a sign. It is a sign of strength. A sign of strength. And, and sometimes, you know, we're watching movies, you know, you've done it, and there's the murderer. He is a dirty, stinking scoundrel. He has murdered people, and the good guy is coming after him. And down inside, that carnal person is like, kill that dirty dog. Get that dirty, kill him, wipe him out. Because that's that old carnal man inside of us wanting to see that justice. And you've seen some of the movies where the guy comes and he has the opportunity, it's not a law officer or anything, it's just the individual, maybe it's their child to get killed, their parent to get killed, or whoever, and they have the opportunity to take their life out, and they say, you know what, I'm not going to take your life, I'm going to allow it to go through this, and I'm going to have forgiveness, you know, and that's what God calls for us to do. That takes strength. That takes strength. It takes a strong person to forgive. Again, from this Mayo Clinic webpage. And remember, this is not a biblical article. It says, what are the benefits of forgiving someone? Letting go of grudges and bitterness can make way for improved health hmm, and peace of mind. Ooh, how about that? Forgiveness can lead to healthier relationships because if you're holding grudges against this, and this happened in my former marriage, and let me tell you one thing, I'm remarried, and I'm going to, uh, you know, or whatever. This happened in my, yeah, it, it ruins, it, you know, if you don't forgive, it ruins relationships. But if you do forgive, you have healthier relationships. Improve mental health. Improve mental health. There's less anxiety if you don't dwell on these things uh, and forgive. Less stress. Um, less hostility. Fewer symptoms of depression. Lower blood pressure. How about that one? Take the pills and throw them out. Don't go home and do that because Dave just said this. Maybe you can check with your doctor, okay? Uh, but I'm saying this can help. A stronger immune system. Believe it or not, yeah. You know, my son, who's sick again today, I'm like, I am going out and buying that boy some zinc. I'm going to go buy it because he's supposed to be playing drums today. I said, I'm going to buy him. Take his half car every day and say, son, have you taken your vitamins yet today? Take your vitamins. Because, you know, he, he catches stuff a, a, a lot there. But anyway... Because we do stress ourselves out, and if we're holding grudges and our, our bodies are just all tense and you can't relax because we're upset all the time and you're bitter and you're angry, 
Well, ain't no wonder your blood pressure is high. It ain't no wonder you're having issues because your body, just look at it. It's like a knot, man. I, I knew a lady who had problems with pain. So she goes to this guy to help with pain management. And the woman, and, and the doctor told the lady, said, ma'am, I'll tell you, a lot of this right here is of your own doing. You are holding a lot of stuff from your past. And a lot of this pain is because of what you're holding in and what you're not letting go of. So these things do affect us. Improved heart health and improved self-esteem. So there was a good quote from a guy named Oscar Wilde who's a playwright and a wit. Uh, it says, always forgive your enemies. Nothing annoys them so much. <laughs> yeah. Hey, but uh, I want to do something here. Scott, you and John start in the front, and I got John and Zach back here in the back. And I know I have used these before, but I want to hand these out so everybody has them again. And some of you are new here. Uh, but you'll take and make sure everybody gets one of these. I think this is such a powerful tool. This came through the Moore study. So, yes, wasn't that long ago that I handed them out. But I believe with all my heart that this tool right here can help you with the situations you're in. So hang on to it. Put it on your refrigerator. Or uh, if you don't like things on your refrigerator, put it somewhere where you can see it. Uh, but their picture will come up on the screen if it hadn't already. Maybe it's up there. And, and, and it talks about from fruits to roots and, and what in our life. And, and so as we, we look at this, um, and as we look at it, the praise team wants to go ahead and start making their way forward here today. But anyway, when you look at this, roots to fruit, the roots is who is God in our life. That's what the roots are, this tree here. Who is God? That's our roots. Who is God? The trunk, what is God? What has he done? What has he done? So in other words, who is God? He is all-powerful. He is almighty. In my life, I believe that. What is the trunk? Or what has he done? He redeemed me. He redeemed me. If you're a chosen fan, you know, and you look at that first one, and when uh, Mary would quote that scripture and, and talk about I am his, he redeemed me. So we must let this thing get our branches. Who am I? I am a loved child of God. I am a loved you believe? Do you believe that? And our fruit, how do you live? I live in freedom. But here's what happens. Here's where the tool comes in, all right? You're having problems, then you can trace it back to the roots. You're having, and I'm not always saying that anytime you have anxiety or depression, it's always this. Sometimes there are medical problems, there are chemical problems. Sometimes we bring those chemical problems on ourselves. Hey, 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 I'm stepping on my own toes. Years ago, I would burn candles at both ends, and I'd still come close to doing that. You've got to say, slow down, Dave, because... You get your body to where it can't rest, and then when something hits you, bam, it knocks you clean off your rocker. And so we need to take time to refresh our bodies. And Dave is stepping on his own toes right here, okay? Because I used to, I'm doing better than what I used to do, but yeah, then that's bad. So, so there are sometimes, there's sometimes medical issues. Why do we sit there and go like, well, I don't know if I need to take this particular medicine because we think that our brain is not an organ in our body, just like our heart, we, you know. And so I'm not saying that's always the answer, and I'm not saying that it's something that's happened in your past, but I'm saying here's some help, all right? And, and so when you start looking and say, well, what type of fruit am I bearing right now? Well, I'm anxious. I'm angry. I, I have fear. Why? You start going back. What untruth do you believe about yourself? What I'm is, I must have control. I've got to have control, and, and, and I'm doomed. I'm doomed. That's what you're believing about yourself. And then you go back and you go, what untruth do I believe about what God has done? He has abandoned me. God has left me. Where is God? That's an untruth you're believing. Um, God doesn't care for me. God doesn't love me. What untruth do you believe about um, what, he, uh, what he's done? That's what it said. You know, he's abandoned me. What untruth do I believe about God? He is not all-powerful. He's not in control. He is unloving. So this is just some things that will help us as we're striving to allow the Holy Spirit. And we can look at our fruits in our life and be like, why am I feeling like this? What's making me think? And I'm not saying that every time. Like I said, there are some times that the, body, the chemistry in our body can get off. Sometimes we do it by the way we live. Sometimes it's just something that happens within our bodies, all right? And, and so don't just automatically freak out and go like, I must be a terrible sinful person. No, no, no. These are helps. Helps. I'm going through things where my emotions are not in control. And what do I believe? Look at that. What, what am I believing wrong about myself? When I look at what the root, root to the fruit is, 
When I realize that God is almighty, he is all powerful, uh, he, uh, he has redeemed me, he doesn't care where I've been, he loves me, he's redeemed me, and in my branches, I am a love child of God, I am a love child of God, God loves me, and my fruit, I will find that freedom. When something goes haywire, that might be a tool to help you. And so, these are just some things to help us break the problems within us. We need to allow the Holy Spirit to be our guide. And the more time that we pray to God, and I'm not saying, you know, sometimes prayer scares people. I don't know if I know the right way to pray. It's talking to God the Father is what it is. Just talk. Some people will come in and we'll be in a meeting or something and meet with somebody, and they'll say, I really don't know how to pray. Then they pray, and I get tears in my eyes. I'm like, dude, that is beautiful. All you did was just talk to God. You didn't think you had to have a formula. It was so beautiful. And it brings tears to your eyes. So as you grow, as you're dealing with things, pray to God. It can be, you know, point second prayers. You know, you're driving down the road and someone crawls across your mind and you pray for them right there. You know, or something beautiful happens and, and you're like, God, you are so awesome. Thank you for being an awesome God. Thank you for loving me. You know, with your quick prayers or their deep prayers, that you're, you're in a special place where you're praying. If you want the Holy Spirit to move in your life, do that. Read God's Word. Even if you're not a reader, read a little bit at a time. I would rather see somebody read a little bit at a time and understand it than read everything and have no idea what in the world they read just because they had to read the Bible. No, read something and let it speak to you. Ask questions. Read into it. And let that the Holy Spirit then begins to work. And then I love the Holy Spirit because he likes to whisper. He likes to whisper things in your ear. And always listen to the whisper. The day I was late for that funeral, I walked out of the store up here before I knew what time it was. And I saw a man who attends here some. And I saw him in the car and I waved at him and smiled and he kind of waved back. And something inside of me said, go over and say hi to him. He rolled down the window and I walked in up to him and I said, hey, how's it going? He said, not good. That kind of shocked me because everybody always says, oh, good, good. He said, not good. And I was like, oh, well, what's wrong? He said, I have cancer in my throat and I found out it's moved to my lungs. He said, my wife just had a stroke last week. And I said, wow, can I pray for you? And so I just reached my hand in the car and prayed for him. He's on our prayer list now and, and praying for that situation. And after I thought about it, I thought, okay, God, was I supposed to be late for that funeral? But I know I was just supposed to walk over to that car and take a moment out of time and speak to him. That was God's plan. The Holy Spirit whispers to us. And many times we just go like, I have this thought I should have. Nah, the Holy Spirit is whispering. He is speaking to you. Isn't that neat? That's neat. You're like, me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The Holy Spirit, God's Spirit speaks to us. Tells us to do certain things. Also, he, he convicts us. You know, you, have, you know you've got to forgive. You know you have to forgive that person. Yes, they wrong you. Forgiveness doesn't mean that what that person did was all right. If they never apologize, that's not forgiveness. Forgiveness is I am releasing this. And I'm allowing God's spirit to use me as a vessel so that I don't become some mean, old, bitter person who people can't stand to be around. I want to be somebody that people are drawn to because they see Jesus in them and I can tell them about Jesus. I want to change for that. I want to change for the better. I want to change for that. So Paul says this in Colossians 3, 12 through 14. Marvin shared this scripture this past week. When I read it, I thought, that's exactly what I'm speaking on this week and what I need to put in practice in my life. Colossians 3, 12 through 14. Therefore, as God's chosen people, and, uh, it's not on the screen, so therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, that's us, root to fruit, clothe yourselves with compassion. Compassion. I'm so thankful there was a meal here yesterday. Seth, a business partner, was related to these people. Seth puts out a word, hey, can y'all bring desserts? That woman, when I was in there at that memorial service, said, I walked into that building. I said, what are all these desserts in here? What is, who is, what is it? I'm so thankful. You people are so kind. That's why, because she came here back in 2015 or so until her sister got sick. This old, this older, little bit older lady. And then she couldn't come anymore. And she says, that's why I'm coming back to worship. And, and church you. You were led by the Holy Spirit to do this and to touch these people's hearts during their time of grieving. And so be compassionate. Close yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. We all mess, all right? Quit pointing a finger at somebody. Do you know that person over there? Oh, look in the mirror and say, you know this person right here? 
help one another, bear with one another. Quit saying, I'm out of here, I'm done. I can't stand them people no more. No, 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 no. Bear with one another. Let that stuff out there that the Holy Spirit says here. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave us. <clears throat> and over all virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. I always say this. I want to be as merciful to others as God is to me. Mm. It's a tough one. But when I see folks, and maybe they've done something to me and they've hurt God, I want to be as merciful. doesn't mean that we don't hold people accountable. No, it doesn't mean that. But I want to be as merciful. I don't want to gossip about the sin they're in. i got my own stuff to work on. I just want to help. And that's what we want to do as a church. We want to be changed so that we can reach the world for Jesus. From the time Pascal was very small, her and her younger brother were abused by their mother, their biological mother. And, and abuse was both physical and emotional. And so sometimes her father would try to intervene, but the mother was abusive to him too. And, and Pascal's mother was continuing a cycle. You see, when she grew up, she lived in an abusive home. And that cycle continued. And, and so Pascal, she endured this until she got old enough. And when she became of age and she gra graduated high school, she moved across the country so she wouldn't have to deal with that. And, and then she had a, a little girl, Pascal did, and she thought, I'm going to try to make that relationship with my mom again. But guess what? Her mom was abusive to her granddaughter, to Pascal's daughter. And so she, again, broke that relationship. And time passed... And the news came to her that her mother had been suffering some strokes and now it had a major stroke. And her mother uh, had such brain damage that she couldn't communicate and, and, or take care of herself. And with no one else to help, Pascal said, I'm moving back to sit by my mom's bedside, to read to her, to take care of her. And Pascal says the hate that she had for her mother just dissipated into forgiveness and love. Pascal broke the chain of abuse and uncontrolled emotions. Wow. Her little daughter doesn't have to follow that chain now. Pascal broke it. You know, anger, uncontrolled anger, is something we need to start dealing with, praying with, and finding tools to deal with it, whether it's hurt that festers up inside of us. Whatever these things are, anything that controls us and not the Holy Spirit is sin. So that's why the Holy Spirit lovingly wants to move in and help us be the vessels that God wants us to be. He wants us to be changed, changed, so that we can be vessels to show others the love of Jesus. And sometimes the people who you might think have lived the most terrible lives become the greatest tools in the toolbox for Jesus. Because of the forgiveness they have experienced, they rise up to share with others. Church, let's have these changed emotions, allowing the Holy Spirit to live in our lives so we can be a witness for others. God has made a difference in people's lives all through the scriptures, and you can read about it. He's the same God that moves today. If you have a need today, whether for prayer, whether to, to accept Jesus, to be baptized, whatever it might be, don't put it off. And maybe it's just prayer, like I've got some issues. We have prayer partners all over the corners of the building. I'll be down front. Never be ashamed to ask for prayer. My goodness. It's the least we can do for one another, which is the most we can do. Isn't that funny? Uh, that we can do that. So let's be standing. We're praying and we're going to sing. Saying, God. Father, you are an amazing God, an awesome God. And Lord, I look at this and see that sometimes I really struggle with some of this. Let it go. And so your Holy Spirit, I need him to minister more in my life. And I pray for folks right now who are striving to do this and there's hurts in their lives that they can forgive and find wholeness and be used as a vessel to share your love. God, we thank you for being that same God in Jesus' name. Amen.